Yep, another artist is doing the six fan arts thing. Did you put in a request? Maybe I drew it. Hello and welcome back to Jenna Gets Creative. As I just mentioned, today I am starting my six fan art. As you can see, I've already chosen and sketched all six thanks to suggestions I got across my social media platforms, but in today's video we're only going to finish two of them. I intended for this to be a two-part mini-series, but now it's looking like three parts. I divide a 9 by 12 inch sheet of mixed media paper into six rectangles with gap, similar to the original template, so the these are really small, yet the first one took me over two hours. <laughs> Thank you so much to everyone who made suggestions. I'm very sorry to the person I may have unintentionally insulted when my phone's autocorrect made me leave a rather awkward reply. I meant to tell someone their suggestion was good, but evidently I missed the G and my phone turned OOD into old. I didn't mean to say your suggestion was old. What does that even mean? The original template and idea for the hashtag six fan arts challenge comes from the Instagram account of artist Melissa Caprulion. Very sorry if I mispronounced that. Her social media handle is up on screen now, and I'll also mention it in the description and tag her when I share this stuff on my own Instagram. Follow me on Instagram too, by the way, at Jenna Gets Creative YT. Note the YT at the end. Another woman named Jenna already had Jenna Gets Creative when I decided that I needed an Instagram. I remember looking through her photos and I see now her account's private, so now I'm wondering if she was getting contacted by people trying to collaborate with me. <laughs> Oops, sorry other Jenna. Anyway, the first two fan arts I'll be finishing today are Tiana from Disney's The Princess and the Frog and Unico from The Fantastic Adventures of Unico. Tiana was one of several characters my best friend suggested as soon as I posted the blank six fan arts template on Instagram, so I figured it was only fitting to do her in the top left as my first piece. I admit I didn't pay too much attention to The Princess and the Frog when it first came out in 2009. I was in my early 20s living with a young man I thought I was going to marry and settle with on the opposite side of the country from where I am now, studying history and psychology for a career I thought I was going to have teaching high school students. An animated movie based on the children's bedtime story The Frog Prince wasn't exactly high on my list. Don't feel bad on my behalf that I didn't end up pursuing those things though. I ended up making different choices and if I hadn't I wouldn't have met my best friend or my husband and I wouldn't have my daughter. But let's get back on topic. I decided to go with this typical promotional image pose of human and Tiana and Frog Naveen at the Mardi Gras party, before the kiss that turns Tiana into a frog and starts the whole adventure. I feel like most of the time when people draw Tiana, if they're drawing her in a dress, they pick the green number from the very end, her Disney princess look. I prefer the elegant blue number she changes into at the party, presumably borrowing something from Lottie's wardrobe because it's certainly not what she showed up in. I want to take a minute and venture into a potentially heated topic and talk about Tiana's hair. It's unclear exactly exactly how curly her hair is meant to be because of the simplified style of the artwork in this film, but I appreciate the fact that Disney hasn't completely smoothed her hair out in every style she wears it in like they do with most European princesses, because it certainly wouldn't be smooth. She's a black girl in New Orleans in the mid-1920s, she's not a woman of wealth, and she turns down opportunities to have a night out on the town with her friends in favor of working an extra shift to save for her restaurant. It's pretty safe to assume she was wasn't going to a fancy salon and paying for expensive treatments to straighten her hair. And given that women in the 1960s were using clothing irons to straighten their hair, it's also a safe bet that Tiana didn't have any sort of home straightening iron in her little apartment in the 1920s. So she was definitely wearing her hair natural for day-to-day -day purposes, and probably wouldn't have indulged in any sort of semi-permanent straightening techniques the rare time she does dress up. Add on top of that the fact that she changed from her serving look into this blue gown princess look in Lottie's bedroom, having come straight from her kitchen and served at the party for a while, her hair was styled quickly and probably with blonde girl Lottie's tools and products. I appreciate the curly strays and the implied texture in the shape of her bun. I was careful in my version of this look not to make the lines and edges of her hair look too perfect as to imply straight hair. I did my Tiana artwork using Faber-Castell Gold Faber pencils. I've reviewed these pencils before, but it's been a while since I've worked on a piece exclusively in these pencils, so let's talk about them again. They're a wax-based core, and being 
the Goldfaber label their student quality pencils, their student quality supplies. Like most Faber-Castell products, if you swatch these pencils next to the professional quality Polychromos pencils bearing the same color numbers, you'll see that the same pigments have been used. What's different is the other ingredients that go into the pencil core. Polychromos are oil-based cores, there's a lot of pigment used, and only as much finder as required to make the strong functional leads they need. Gold Fabers, being student quality pencils, have more binder and less pigment. This means you have to work harder to get opaque coverage, and you're not going to be able to layer as much without help from something like OMS. They have a much harder core than other popular wax based pencils like Prismacolor, so it's easy to accidentally leave harsh lines or scratch unintended texture into previous layers when layering and blending. I think these pencils are a great starting point for artists who are learning to work in colored pencils or crafters who don't feel the need to spend top dollar for professional pencils, but these pencils do have limitations. You may notice me patting down areas when I was finished burnishing, and that's to remove loose pigment and binder that doesn't stick but also doesn't easily blow away. You may also notice me frequently erasing stray smudged color off of surrounding white areas. I had no choice but to do preliminary ink line work on Unico when I moved on to the second rectangle because there was so much color debris over there that it needed to be erased. I definitely encountered this with the Firewolf I drew as part of a collab that never happened, which turned into the footage I used when I originally reviewed these pencils. Sorry by the way for the background noise, the neighbor's kid is riding an ATV up and down their driveway. It's rather annoying. I ended up cutting that wolf out and gluing it onto different paper because of the massive halo of smudged color all around him. It's possible that the right paper would mitigate this. I'm using Canson XL mixed media paper here, and while it's a decent surface for most supplies, it's not the best for anything. These pencils are probably more light fast than other student pencils, such as Prismacolor's Scholars, which I assume because they appear to use the same pigments as Polychromos, which are almost all very light fast. That said, the cores are completely different, and all the other ingredients that go into a pencil's core can affect things like light fastness, so I wouldn't blindly trust that these are going to last forever. Faber-Castell doesn't release light fastness information on their Gold Faber product, which likely means that they don't bother to test the line. I finished this piece off with line work using a graphite brush liner and some white details using a Sakura Jelly Roll white gel pen. Brush pens aren't my favorite for final line work since I find it difficult to get consistent lines, but fine liner nibs tend to clog and scratch when used over wax, so I opted to gently lay the ink on top with a brush liner. This dried quickly in place and didn't smudge at all, which I was worried about. Overall, I'm happy with this piece, but I'm frustrated that I couldn't completely flatten the paper's tooth and fill in all the little white gaps, and I'm annoyed that roughly 10 square inches took over two hours to complete. The second fan art I decided to do is, as already mentioned, Unico from The Fantastic Adventures of Unico. I'll admit I wasn't at all familiar with this character or series before receiving this suggestion. The Fantastic Adventures of Unico, a follow-up series called Unico in the Island of Magic, and various other guest appearances of this character in other animated properties are all Japanese-created anime shows. The character was first created in manga form in the 1970s, and apparently English dubs of the original animes were aired in the USA on Disney Channel in the early and mid-1980s. I missed that boat though, both because the channel didn't air where I was growing up in Canada at the time, and because early to mid-80s is a little too early for my cartoon watching years. DVDs of Unico series and feature-length films were eventually English dubbed and sold in North America in 2012, but that's the year 24-year-old yours truly was moving across the country to start a second bachelor degree program in an entirely new province. I moved away from my anime-loving friends from high school, hadn't yet made anime-loving friends over here in Newfoundland, and I didn't have the time or advertising sources to even know that this existed. So yeah, first I've heard of this adorable character. Unico is a baby unicorn character, mostly white with pink mane, though he is traditionally shaded in light blue. 
I based this pose on a particular image I saw of him, since I'm not overly familiar, but I did put my own flair on it. I know I've drawn his features all a little different than the anime style, and I think that's kind of the point of this challenge. Fan art in your own style. So here's what a round little pink maned white unicorn from an anime looks like in my style. <laughs> and please forgive any details that look unfinished with the markers. Mixed media paper is much thirstier than marker paper. The ink soaks right in, looks darker, and doesn't blend as much. It works for something like this where I want harsh edges on my shading, but it also means it was hard to control where the edges of colors ended up and how smooth blocks of color ended up being. I haven't decided yet what mediums I'm going to use for the remaining four characters, so feel free to make suggestions in the comments down below. The other four characters are Yoda, Wandering Oaken, Hey Hey, and Captain Amelia. I'm very tempted to pull out the Conte crayons for one of these maybe Yoda. If you're looking for something else to watch, I've got some suggestions for you on the left side of the screen. And if you want to see more of that teeny weeny art challenge a few of us did recently, then come back on Saturday for a bonus video encore. I upload art content twice a week at minimum every Tuesday and Thursday, and if you like living life creatively, whatever that means to you, I'd love to have you along for the ride. Bye guys!